Okay, folks, 2.30 has passed, so we should actually talk about ETEX for a bit. And on a lighthearted note, it was uh, only one of my goals in putting together this panel that it was going to be Accentapalooza, but, and you'll, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about in a little while. Um, E-texts. Like so many panels that, 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 that I sort of get an idea for, it started in orneriness, but it has moved from orneriness to, to something else uh, since then. Um, I, my name, by the way, is Glenda Morgan. I'm from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I direct academic technologies. And uh, I saw recently a call for proposals and a call for participation in a library publishing conference in Kansas City. And it turns out that my, my, my worst fears were not realized, but in the call there was a lot of talk about scholarly publishing in the library as a, as a thing that was growing in speed and momentum and things like that, but not much conversation about textbook publishing, so the more teaching and learning kind of things. Um, and I thought, damn, you know, we really should be talking about this because a lot of places are doing it. We're doing it at Illinois, not in the library, we're doing it in IT. I knew that UCLA had an initiative underway. I knew that Purdue had an initiative underway. SUNY has a giant textbook project that they're doing, the University of Oregon, University of Massachusetts Amherst. So there's a growing sort of sense out there that um, you know, we're getting into the textbook publishing business either in IT or more commonly in libraries. And we really need to sort of talk about it as a, as a movement. You know, and it is really a sort of interesting movement, I think, both in terms of its the need for it um, in, in terms of the growing costs of, 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 of textbooks, but also what it sort of means, uh, you know, the larger implications of that. So we've pulled together a bunch of people to talk about e-textbook initiatives at their institutions. We've got Milan Basole from the University of Illinois. Um, Todd. Grapone. Grapone, yeah, I didn't want to do terrible things to the pronunciation here, um, from UCLA, and Pat Reed, from Purdue University, um, just to sort of, and, and sort of through exploring those different things, we can get a sense of what some of the issues are and what some of the challenges are. So I'm gonna stop yakking and, and hand it immediately over to, uh, to, uh, to Pat Reed, who's gonna kick off. All right, so um, I thought I'd start off by talking about some of the different struggles that we've had at Purdue. I've been at Purdue for two and a half, three years now, and we have, in that time, taken a look at course load, course smart, vital source, uh, about half a dozen other different third party platforms for providing e texts. We have also um, got, I cannot tell you how many different building blocks in Blackboard for publishers who actually go to our faculty members and convince our faculty members that it'll only take half an hour for us to install a building block for them so that they can then have an e-text uh, built in. Um, and this has been very frustrating, but about uh, six months ago, we decided that we would take a look at this from a completely different angle. So instead of taking a look at third-party platforms, we decided we're going to put that on hold. And one of the main reasons is that there is some suspicion that the state of Illinois, no, Indiana, I'm, I'm with Purdue and we're in Indiana. It's really close to the border, though. Yeah. It's just a matter of time till we invade and take them over. <laughs> and, and wouldn't you rather be in, in Illinois rather than Indiana? Um, so there's some talk that the state of Indiana is going to uh, pass a requirement that all of the public universities will use the same third-party platform and that they will dictate what that is and when. So we decided let's, let's skip that because that is just a major struggle anyway. Purdue does not own its bookstores. We, have, we do not contract with our bookstores and we are not in competition with our bookstores. So that is one of the basis, uh, one of the things that has made it even more of a struggle when we take a look at e-texts. Despite that, we've decided we're going to be in competition with our uh, community in this one area. 
And so uh, we decided that we would identify a completely different purpose. We are now looking at e-texts in two different lights. One is as um, open educational resources, and the other is as a uh, method for faculty to publish books at either an extremely low cost to their students or books that are not really books, things that are far more innovative and therefore uh, the current publishers cannot meet their requirements. And so those are, those are some of the reasons that we decided to go into two different initiatives. The first one that I'd like to talk about uh, is the open, oh, we're remote, look at that, thank you. <laughs> Make it much easier. Uh, is our Open Education Resources Initiative. And uh, raise your hand if you do not know what OERs are. Okay, just a, a couple of you. Uh, open Educational Resources are uh, textbooks and other media that are available online absolutely uh, copyright uh, free or shared so that anybody can use them. And the idea is that uh, one faculty member at one institute might create a chemistry textbook, uh, put it online and make it so that another professor at another university can use that, make changes to it. The only caveat is that whatever changes are made must also be available to everybody without any costing. And so uh, we decided that this, for our large enrollment courses, might actually be a, a very effective way of cutting costs to students. Um, and so what we are looking at here is adopting in reducing our textbook costs by eliminating a textbook for a high enrollment uh, freshman course. And at Purdue, when I talk about high enrollment, we're talking about 1,600 to 2,000 students per year. Uh, so if we can cut a textbook that is $150 for that many students, that's higher math than I can do. So, um, how do I forward it? Oh no. Why did you do this? Point it at the... Oh, point it at it. At the laptop. All right, we'll just go over and do this. <laughs> Pat works in IT. Yeah. <laughs> I am technology challenged. I can't work my remote for my TV either. So, as I said, our target courses for this are high enrollment courses. And we're looking for courses that don't have an electronic component because right now a lot of the publishers are sort of packaging textbooks with another online piece of homework or something that sort of ties it together, makes it very uh, useful for the instructor, but actually makes it significantly more difficult to replace that online component later on with uh, OER materials. And uh, we also are looking for a common textbook across all of the sections of a course. So if we've got a course that's got 1,600 students, that means we might have, uh, for English, uh, our open entry uh, English course, we might have uh, 100 different sections. And that means we have got 100 different instructors, possibly. And who is it that has made it uh, that de determination of what textbook or textbooks that they will use. Very frequently, uh, each instructor selects their own textbook. Well, we do have some courses like our Econ 250 where there's one textbook, they have no web access uh, component, and so this would be a likely candidate for this kind of a project. We also need volunteer faculty. Um, I don't know about your areas, but that's, um, that can be a challenge. That actually may be the biggest challenge of all of them. So is this mic on? Oh, it is, so I could just stand here. So uh, what we're going to provide to the faculty who uh, go into the OER initiative for us, we will provide them with uh, some, uh, we will work with them to identify what are the objectives that they want for their textbooks. Then we have hired a company who will go out and search for OER materials that will meet those objectives so that the faculty member is not actually having to do that research. 
present, we will present those to the faculty member. The faculty member th then can determine which pieces are going to be of the quality and the uh, progression that they are looking for, and then we can meld those together into a new OER or, hopefully, just add some multimedia, add some uh, questions to make some uh, interaction in it, and then create something that the faculty member can then adopt. Um, one, of, uh, one of the other things we'll provide that seems to be missing in a lot of the um, e-text initiatives is we will provide support to both the faculty and the students in how to actually use an e-text. And when you consider that for years and years, people have been trying to teach students how to read a regular textbook. Adding an e-text on top of it can actually make it more difficult for them. So we're hoping that we'll be able to actually combine those so that we will be able to teach the students how to read a textbook that happens to be online. Uh, how to use the highlighting features and uh, how to actually read those chapter headings so that the chapter headings will help guide them. And there is also a potential for incentives for the faculty member. Uh, we're not guaranteeing this, but some faculty members have just said they've just got so many, you know, if you've got a course that's got 1,600 students in it, you might be busy. And so we're going to try and help them by providing some incentives for summer work or, or other things like that. The other project we've got going on is uh, called the eText Pilot, and this is similar to but different from the OER Pilot. Here, we are actually encouraging faculty to develop their own materials, and this could be uh, their own materials uh, as in a regular textbook. Some faculty members have got textbooks that are, the publishers have given them back the copyrights uh, privileges for. So, for example, some of our faculty teach high-level courses that only have 30 students a year, and the publishers are not interested in those kinds of books. They just do not earn enough money on those. And so uh, rather than hold on to the copyright, they've given those back to the instructors, and we're helping some of them put those online instead. Uh, we also are looking at some initiatives that are a little more innovative. We have got um, one faculty member who is, uh, he, last semester and the semester before, he gave extra credit points to his students if they could uh, send him a link to a website that had examples or information about what they were studying in organic chemistry that week. And now what he wants to do is compile all of those, eliminate the textbook, and use completely online materials instead. So it's nothing, nothing that is original to him, and he's not going to be copywriting it or anything like that, but it's a unique, unique way of getting his uh, students involved as well as providing his uh, students with a significantly less expensive. His textbook was $275 for organic chemistry. So uh, on this, on this e-text uh, pilot, one of the purposes is that the students either pay a minimal fee or no fee at all, depending on uh, the faculty member. The targets here are faculty that want to try something different or are interested in replacing their current textbook or just developing something on their own. And in this, we've actually teamed up with the Purdue libraries. I'm in the uh, in information technology area, and we have teamed up with our libraries area. So the university press people uh, have some expertise in copy editing and project management of textbook development. And so they are providing that expertise. My uh, CIO, uh, Jerry McCartney, is providing some um, a small amount of incentive funding to the faculty, and together we are supporting the faculty in development. So some of the issues that we have faced with this are getting faculty buy-in. Um, if we've got a faculty member, I've had several faculty members tell me that they've written their own book and they earn more on their book than they do in their annual salary. So why on earth would they want to move into something that was less expensive? And so for those faculty, obviously this is not, neither of these are a good solution. 
Uh, for many other faculty, however, we do have faculty who have written their own materials and just want to provide them at a lower cost, not just to Purdue students, but also to other universities. Uh, time is a little bit of an issue. Um, finding time to meet with all of the faculty and discuss their requirements. Sustainability, once they've actually developed the materials, how do we make it so that it stays current? How do we make it so that the faculty understand the purpose of having editions of books? How do we make it so that if we are incentivizing the faculty to develop a new item in the first place, what is it that we can do to incentivize them to keep that book current and also create, how do we get faculty to create additional books? In the state of Indiana, we do not believe that we are allowed to make a profit. So if we provide an incentive to faculty to create a textbook, can we at least do it back enough so that next year we can provide that same faculty, uh, that same incentive to additional faculty? So we've got to really study that uh, in detail. Uh, again, time is a little bit of an issue uh, working with faculty on project management. Platform uh, selection and contracting. We have spent, I cannot tell you how many hours working with different contractors, uh, different platforms. We've spoken with Illinois uh, at great length. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a platform that was built at Purdue and is now uh, external to Purdue that uh, we have a vested interest in working with. So we're still working on that piece of it. And the time spent on that has been pretty significant. And then lastly, all of our faculty have got individualized needs. Uh, what, uh, what Paul Wenthold wants is not at all the same thing that Jamie Nan wants, and what she wants is not the same as what Melanie Morgan wants. And all of these we have to work with individually, uh, work with the libraries to find the best combination of IT staff and library staff and perhaps people in our Center for Instructional Excellence to work with them. And all of that, again, takes time. Uh, so that is all that I need to say. Here I am. Please do feel free to give me a call, uh, call email me if you would like to speak with me, find out more about either of the initiatives that we're working on. Would you like to try using this? Uh, I'll, I, I'll just okay. use this, thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's fine, but. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the UCLA project. Uh, we're calling it the Affordable Course Materials Initiative. Uh, it was, um, we had noticed a few universities doing some uh, open textbook uh, projects that, for example, UMass, Temple, and MIT, uh, our project, similar to Pat's, is it got a little, uh, we wanted to have a kind of a broader <clears throat> program to focus on, uh, more on OER rather than uh, textbooks. Um, and we organized really around four principles. Uh, we wanted to lower the cost to the students, build uh, open educational resources, uh, integrate our collections used uh, with uh, licensed uh, content and content created by faculty, we wanted to do some outreach to faculty as well. Uh, and so those are the four guiding principles. Our, our program itself was sponsored by our executive vice chancellor uh, for research, the libraries, and the California Digital Library. Um, and we're, uh, I, we didn't do a journal subvention program. We wanted to do something a little bit broader. We saw new material coming uh, from our faculty, and we wanted to kind of um, find a way to integrate that. Um, this, project was launched uh, last quarter, and so here's the first quarter by the numbers. Uh, the pilot program incentivizes instructors to use low cost or free alternatives to expensive uh, course material. These include open access scholarly resources, library licensed and owned resources, and learning objects and texts that faculty create themselves. Uh, we provided awards of $1,000 each. Uh, for instructors teaching courses with enrollment f with fewer than 200 students and awards of 2,500 each for uh, instructors teaching courses with an enrollment of greater than 200. Uh, these are modest yet significant sums. They're really meant to offer an incentive to, um, uh, for the uh, faculty to take the time 
uh, to identify re new resources, adjust their syllabus, and modify assignments. Uh, and they can also be used to cover actual expenses incurred by the instructor. Uh, collection development awards uh, may also be um, provided to build or enhance library collections in support of specific courses. Uh, since our program launched uh, in the pilot last March, we've received 27 applications. We've made 23 awards, uh, 19 of which were money, uh, three collection development assistance. Um, you know, that uh, entailed um, acquiring or licensing items for the library because they're needed for the course, and one, um, uh, one award for expertise in helping to sort out copyright issues for an open access textbook. Uh, the total award, the total amount awarded doesn't reflect other expenditures in the library um, or other um, uh, resources from the collections budget, for example, we might have put towards the, the program. As I mentioned before, we wanted uh, a pretty broad program. Uh, and so ex uh, applications have come from instructors in many different departments across campus. Um, English, nursing, law, and Chinese had multiple uh, awards. Uh, a journal subvention program we feel would have looked a lot different. Um, we wanted a, a broad campus scope. Uh, and subvention programs uh, have more uptake from science and we, we really wanted a, a, a broader campus appeal. Uh, we felt that that was going to be more impactful than an open textbook program, um, which we felt on our campus we could only do a few of those. We wanted something um, bigger. And our OVCR, one of our sponsors, didn't really want to do a journal subvention program. Um, it, he wanted us to do something uh, a little different as well, and, and in order to get his support was pretty important to us. Um, and we also wanted to develop uh, a program that offered faculty members alternatives to uh, journals and textbooks uh, as part of their course material. So we had a lot of faculty members using data in their courses, for example, and this was one way we could uh, help them create um, material for courses. Uh, so um, we've only received complete figures from the courses taught last fall. This is, uh, so here are three of the ones uh, that saved the students the most money. Uh, the numbers represent total savings to a theater course, a mechanical engineering course, and an economics course uh, taught last quarter. Uh, they're calculated by figuring the cost of the materials used the last time the course was taught and the cost during the ACMI awarded quarter. Uh, for example, the last time the engineering course was taught, students had to buy a $200 textbook. Uh, during the ACMI quarter, the instructor created a quote-unquote textbook uh, from his lecture notes, a project he'd been meaning to do for quite a while which uh, he provided to the students at no cost. So 56 students times $200 equals $1,120 for our, one of our courses. Um, so we don't really, uh, aside from the numbers, what we have is uh, some uh, qualitative information, uh, a couple of quotes from our faculty members. Uh, they really liked our approach. It's a team-based approach. Uh, our team is a subject matter expert. Uh, uh, someone who's an IP or copyright expert, a technologist, and a metadata person. Uh, these are the, some of the resources we provide in a team. Um, so uh, we also, uh, at UCLA, have a pretty robust theater and film school, as you might have guessed. Um, and one of the reasons we focused on outreach is we'd seen a couple of our faculty members in the theater and performing arts creating uh, multimedia um, applications, multimedia apps uh, for uh, specific courses. Um, and we, we didn't necessarily think uh, they made uh, informed choices when they chose a platform to develop on and we wanted to get there a little earlier. Um, uh, just these, these two uh, courses, uh, these two apps you see, the one on the um, right is uh, what's called Clip Notes. Uh, it's uh, taught by one of our faculty members, uh, used by one of our faculty members in his, in his course about filmmaking. Uh, it, you, you play a movie and it calls out particular uh, aspects of uh, the film uh, to draw your attention. Uh, for example, uh, if you're interested in a jump cut, you know, learning what that is, how it's incorporated in the movie, uh, it'll go to that section of the movie and show you that uh, particular piece. Uh, the other uh, title there is uh, 
uh, for one of our acting faculty members. Uh, he teaches the undergraduates. It's called Stanislavski at the Movies, and it, it talks about uh, acting in a particular uh, fashion. It'll bring uh, clips of a movie into a text and show you exactly how um, uh, illustrative, illustrative examples of, of what he's teaching in the class. Uh, so. Good afternoon, my name is Milin Basole. I'm with the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our e-text initiative here at, at, at Illinois, and basically go through the, a bit of the genesis of the project and what we have achieved, what we are yet to overcome, and what are our goals. And I'm going to try and be brief so that we can actually spend a, a fair bit of time on Q&A and uh, actually have a discussion rather than a, a presentation here. So eText at Illinois, and I was listening to Pat and Todd, and, and we very much have similar goals. It was essentially conceived to be a reader platform for homegrown and published content. And the, the few goals that we had were um, basically we wanted to reduce the cost burden on students. We want to make sure that um, because there's all this hullabaloo about how much money people spend and how they're going broke, we want to make sure that at least at Illinois that isn't the case. We wanted to somehow eventually make it revenue neutral, as in it be a self-sustaining kind of a system. I, I liked um, Todd's. So it's, it's not just about money; it's it's about other things as well. But the uh, and one of the other important aspects, or probably the important aspects that separates us from from our competition, if you will, is we are universally accessible, and uh, by that I mean that you can access eText at Illinois with any device that has an HTML compliant browser, which basically means any modern device um, which is in existence now. It's not only your laptop your, and your desktop computers, your tablets, your smartphones, but also um, devices for the mobility impaired p uh, folks or for visually impaired folks. We at Illinois, we actually take accessibility at a very, uh, very, very seriously. We have, uh, we, we, we like to say that it's in our DNA because we are one of the first institutions to actually install um, well, curbs which are handicap accessible and bus ra ramps and so on and so forth. So we, um, we are at the forefront of the accessibility movement and we want to make sure that we sustain our, um, our, our um, threshold, if you will. And um, again, it's uh, the, you, uh, the nice part of accessibility is that once we make stuff accessible, it also becomes universally available. So it, it is, like I said, it is, um, on any device you, you would like. And because we can, we can do published material, we, are, we have contracts with uh, two publishers right now looking at more, but the idea is that any published textbook can be also made available on Illinois, uh, eText at Illinois platform. And uh, also any internet connected device. And lastly, we, this is something we, we wish to go, is we, we want to include OERs as well as e-reserves and scholarly works in our eTex platform as well. So it's, we've been in production since about fall of 2010. We have over about, about 2,000 students use it every semester. We have several um, 101 kind of classes on our platform because it's it's a very conducive environment for um, for people who have um, who have multimedia needs. A lot of our classes are actually using eText as a platform for flipped classrooms because they they can produce video which is then included in the book and the book becomes this main. Uh, sort of a reference point for the students, especially for flipped classrooms. They go uh, watch the videos before they come to class, and then they will then um, 
go into a, a classroom or a lab and then expect to have a much more uh, interactive aspect rather than the uh, teaching. The teaching's already done with the video and the students have, are expected to have read the book and um, watch the video before they come to class. And so, and, and again, like I said, it's homegrown and published textbook, so we, are, um, we have quite a few books that are that are already in our platform available to Illinois students and are increasing uh, at a pretty rapid clip. We are throwing this platform uh, to all our, our CIC colleagues, uh, that's uh, Big Ten plus uh, University of Chicago, and they are, uh, uh, they can use our service as a um, software as a service kind of a model where they can like, uh, like Pat was talking about a few minutes ago, it, they can or they will be able to use our platform and deliver our educational content to their students uh, using our platform. So what are a few of our challenges faced? Again, we are a very small team, so we have, our, our growth has been deliberate. We have not literally thrown the floodgates open. We are trying to create as much impact as we can, so we are targeting these um, gen ed type of classes, again, 101 kind of classes, because those are the ones that, um, we, like, like Pat and Todd were saying, have most impact to uh, on how how much we can affect not only the cost, but how we can um, actually use that to enhance teaching and learning, use e-text to, to enhance teaching and learning. Um, there's some reluctance from publishers from using our platform because each one of them have their own platform. They're also well um, sort of in, uh, Crossway would be in bed with Amazon and with Course Load and Course Smart, so it's a, a it's a bit of a model change for them to now use an HTML5 and accessible compliant platform, which is at eText at Illinois, and they don't um, routinely. It's like, well, we cannot do this because then you are giving them access to our content. Yes, we are giving them access to your content, but it's behind uh, it's it's got we are, we are we are doing the drm on our end that takes a bit of convincing so um, there's a bit of reluctance but we have two publishers um, john wiley and pearson who are um, collaborating with us on um, delivering their content using our platform Another one is integration with LMSs. We use primarily Blackboard at Illinois, and we have had some issues in making our, our content and Blackboard talk to each other. And again, that's um, something that was a bit of reluctance from, from Blackboard. The, 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 the interactions that we are seeking, they, it's not uh, something they're uh, familiar with, so it, it's more of a R&D approach there, but it, it's, it's something that we are, again, actively pursuing. Um, also, eText is an online platform right now. The next step we will be taking will be make it offline, so a student could potentially go offline and still read and interact with our platform. The uh, last aspect is making accessibility a priority. Very early on when we were designing this platform, we made sure that anything that isn't accessible will not go on our platform. We were trying very hard to stick to that and to ensure that we are, um, we are one of the more accessible platforms. We have been commended by the National Federation of the Blind um, and other various institutions um, because of our commitment to accessibility. But um, regardless, accessibility is a, is, a, is a moving target because often changes in operating systems, changes in browsers or a, any other um, any other variables can make uh, what was accessible a few days ago not so accessible anymore. So we have to continually be on uh, on a lookout, make sure that we are um, we are supporting the latest and greatest uh, browser versions and operating system versions. And that's again, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge because it's it's um, again that's a priority for us, but it's still a, a it takes a little bit of time. 
Moving, moving forward, we want to integrate eText with eReserves. Right now, we don't have, an, it's, it's basically a homegrown, uh, anything that is homegrown and written at Illinois is available on our platform. Also, some of the published books, but uh, we don't have an integration with eReserves, so we want to ensure that is going forward, that would be something that we will um, we'll create. Ingestion, everything we do is HTML5, so, the, the content that's available to us is not necessarily in HTML, not necessarily in HTML5. So it's, it's a bit of a process and each, each of our books that came to us has come through a different route. So we want to streamline some of that and possibly the contracts with our, 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 our engagement with the publishers is going to streamline that uh, because it's not a, um, each publisher has a different XML format for how they want to um, deliver their books. They are happy to give us PDFs, but PDFs don't fly because they're not as accessible as HTML5. Last again is offline access. That's essentially to enhance the usability. These days it's becoming slightly less relevant because students have smartphones and they're always on. So if they can be on Facebook, they could really be reading e-text on a bus. So we are, uh, but regardless, we do want to make sure that e-text will provide them offline access. So that is a very, very short and brief what, what e-text is about. And we, we like to say at Illinois that e-text is the future of the textbook, textbook of the future. And that's my, the end of my formal presentation. Really want to uh, encourage you to ask questions and possibly engage in a, in a panel discussion that will help us all grow here.